go. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, it's a new study for this week. And um, we're going to uh, continue looking at Daniel, Daniel's last vision. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have here to study this morning. And as we open your word together, we invite your spirit's presence to be here. Help us, Lord, to um, to listen to your voice and be with us in our conversation and study. We ask, Lord, that your name can be glorified upon this earth and that uh, as we study these things, uh, that you can help us to clearly understand them and that they can have an effect in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Well, good morning, everyone. So uh, b before the study this morning, uh, William and I were having a conversation over what was talked about uh, last week regarding the four kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And I think we, we came to an understanding um, that there is uh, four kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, but Rome has divisions, Rome pagan, Rome papal, and then the threefold union at the end, the United States, which is, of course, um, the false prophet, the dragon power, which is the UN, and the papacy that's uh, revived at the end, that's resurrected, um, that those three uh, constitute separate kingdoms. So you can count them as eight kingdoms altogether once, you, once they're differentiated in the book of Revelation. But they're still all constitute uh, Rome. That is, they're all the fourth kingdom in the sense of what we see in Daniel chapter two. So this goes back to the study of Daniel chapter two uh, that we did last week. Now, this last week was sort of a, a difficult week in, in our studies. So a couple of things that I wanna um, you know, clarify. So we've, we've read some articles by Jeff and those have been fairly painful to read. And, and the reason is we, we obviously care for Jeff and um, I don't believe in, that I have any ill will towards Jeff or any ill feelings. Um, uh, actually, we pray for him regularly and for this movement. What we do know is that Jeff presently appears to be fulfilling the role of William Miller after October 22nd, 1844. And um, so we found that um, some of his arguments, some of the articles that he's done, don't seem to be speaking in a way that Jeff used to speak. That is, Jeff was always straightforward. He was always logical and clear. Uh, he developed his ideas really well. And, and we don't find that characteristic in all of these articles. Some, some are better than others, because I went through and read some of them, and some of them are just kind of standard things we believe, and they're presented in ways that Jeff has presented them before. So they're not new or anything. But some of the ideas that he has about July 18, and also Daniel chapter 2, seem to be problematic. And I made a statement which... I don't want to be misconstrued. And that is, I'd noticed early on when I started reading the articles that there was a difference in how Jeff was writing. And, 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 and I seen this before, even in the past, that at times Jeff wasn't always, um, didn't always seem to know what he was doing, where he was going logically. Now, I took that as that he was tired, so that he was exhausted, which he was. And, and so, you know, I made a comment about, you know, that possibly he's having some mental decline. And, and that's not an attack on Jeff as a person. It's not a way to dismiss what he's saying. It's more to try to explain or try to understand what it is we're seeing in his articles. Because it seems unlike Jeff the things in the article. Some people have even questioned whether Jeff is writing them or not. Um, I doubt somebody is, uh, you know, masquerading as Jeff and writing these articles. 
But, you know, in saying that it's, you know, maybe it's mental decline, that's more a way to sort of excuse what's happening. But maybe that isn't the best thing to say, maybe, because we don't know. We don't know what what's going on. But um, but we do know that uh, William Miller, after 1844, has a decline in health, and that does affect him. And he also has people around him who are shielding him from actually looking at what's being presented by the various groups, the various factions that existed after 1844. And so Miller believes that everything is fanaticism. He knows about James and Ellen White and and what they're teaching, but only secondhand. Um, It could be that James and Ellen White may have written letters to him, whether he actually read them or not. I don't know. But but he has an impression about what's going on in the movement, so to speak. And we can say the same thing for Jeff at the present time, that he's going to know about Colin's prediction that failed. Um, we know he knows about it. Um, last fall, when we had the election and Colin believed that there was going to be a landslide victory for the Republicans and eventually through that, Trump was going to come into power. That was one scenario. I mean, Colin was says he was kind of guessing at how it was going to happen. So, so Jeff would know about that. He would know about stuff that we're doing, but it would be presented to him in a way, and I know some of it was presented in, to him in a way that he he actually felt um, that he needed to write 391 words in five paragraphs about it, uh, and that was when we were looking at Rev, at the Pioneer Understanding of Revelation 17. And he thought that we were rejecting the foundation for some reason. But that was what was presented to him. So we know that Jeff doesn't really know what's going on in the movement. He hasn't followed the studies. And so we would have to say that what what he has written has to be interpreted in that context, in the historical context of the fact that we repeat Millerite history. And that, but since Jeff is definitely the one who parallels Miller, and and Jeff had placed Ju- July 18th originally as a parallel to the Great Disappointment, now he seems to be putting it with the first disappointment. Uh, but but we know that it it would parallel the Great Disappointment, and then we would have to say that um, you know what Jeff is doing is just fulfilling his role as Miller. So Heidi and I talked a bit about this yesterday and and wondered how we should approach this. I mean, Jeff is is going to be writing a lot of articles. Are we going to spend our time going through all of Jeff's articles in these studies, um, trying to understand where he's going? And I don't think that that's what God's calling us to do. Um, We know that people are going to read the articles. Everybody's going to read them for themselves and decide what they, they should do with them, whether whether they're worth to continue reading as time goes on. Uh, we may find that it's just not not profitable time reading. Um, so it's going to be up to each person what they're going to do about Jeff writing articles again. The one thing that is pretty clear is if we accept what Jeff is saying in these articles, it would mean that all that has happened since July 18th needs to be set aside, right? That it it can't be trusted. And then all the arguments that led up to July 18th um, would have to also be set aside. July 18th would be a waymark from Jeff's perspective, not because it was a correct prophecy, but just because it was when uh, Moses and Elijah were slain in, and, and, uh, and then left lying in the streets. So, so anyway, I just wanted to make that statement about it. I don't know if anybody else wants to say something about, about it. Do 
Dwight? Difficulty, the difficulty that we face at this point is one where the distraction that is coming from some of these articles is one that we each have to be able to consider for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem that that we're going to face is these distractions are going to come up the closer we come to being able to more clearly understand exactly how the third angel's message is to be presented and the simplicity in which we need to be able to present it. Because this is something that our adversary does not want to see done. Yeah, so um, so you're trying to say what, what that, that so we're coming to understand something. The adversary is trying to distract us from it. Correct. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, and, and as I've thought about it, I mean, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to just go back to Jeff. I mean, that's that's my view. Uh, whether I'm correct or not, I don't know. But it's just, uh, especially those that have been following Jeff for a long time, and um, you know, to them, this movement has always been about Jeff. Now, there's lots who've come into the movement later, and they may be attached to different people in the movement. Um, and so people will make their choices based upon, to a large degree, just who their friends are, who they like, which which I don't think is, is a good plan. Um, you know, we should decide based on what is truth. But, you know, people are going to make various decisions, and it's their decisions to make. It's no one else's decision to make. Um, so so it, we don't know what's going to happen, but it definitely could fracture um, what we see happening with the American and Canadian groups, especially if some of the main people in the American group decide to follow Jeff and just renounce all the stuff that, that Jeff is saying isn't valid. And uh, so... So I don't know. I mean, whether, you know, Steve Welk, is, he's the one putting on the American group, whether he's going to go back to Jeff or not, that would be obviously, you know, something that could happen. But, you know, we're just being, you know, straightforward about what, what's happening. And um, we don't know what's going to happen. But what we need to do is each individually decide. Exactly. And, uh, you know, so people kind of know what I think. I mean, we, we went through some of these studies here. But you have to decide that for yourself. Um, it's not going to be, you know, I can't decide it for anyone else. <clears throat> but I do think we need to look at, um, you know, what we have been studying. Now, what you presented yesterday morning was important in the context of Zechariah chapter four, because Right. This thing with Moses and Elijah is obviously Revelation 11, but Revelation 11 is referencing Zechariah 4. So those those things are connected. <clears throat> um, and, yes, yeah, and, and the other thing is, you know, we, we've understood these lines um, in, in a certain way. That is, we understand that we're repeating Millerite history. So, you know, everything that we've done, like with, um, you know, when we were studying, uh, understanding the lines was really just coming to understand how to create a line. And, and that the only way that we can interpret things is to place them on a line. Right. If we're going to take a story, if we, if we can't put it on a line, and it doesn't mean every line that we make is always correct. That is, sometimes there's things that we don't understand. But if but if we can't put it on a line, we don't actually have a way to interpret that information, right? 
the line that, that we draw will help us interpret what it, whatever story it is or narrative that we're studying. So the one thing that, you know, Jeff isn't doing here is he's not being consistent on how we've understood the lines. Yeah. 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 Somehow his mic turned on. So yeah, Samuel, your mic turns on sometimes. So um, and it's very loud. So you got to be careful there. Anyway, so <clears throat> we have been studying Daniel chapter 11 and where we were when we started last Sunday, when we started looking at Jeff's articles, is we were addressing uh, the seven kings of Persia. And, and I think that that's where we should go back. So I'm going to go to that slide there and, and finish this off. And, and, and I shouldn't say really finish it off. At least we're going to uh, look at this in a way that we can then um, look at Daniel chapter, or not Daniel chapter 12, Revelation 12, 13, and 17. So just as a review, we can see that we have uh, the first seven kings of Persia, we've always marked Cyrus, Cambyses, False Myrtus, Darius, the Persian, Xerxes, Ahasuerus, Artabanus is the sixth, and Artaxerxes is the seventh. And um, when we had compared the presidents of the United States, uh, we looked at the time of the end in 539 and 537, and we lined them up with Reagan and Bush in 1989 to 1991. And so we don't wreck it. We don't line up Reagan with Cyrus. We line up Reagan with Darius the Mede. So Bush the first becomes the first of these uh, presidents in the time of the end. And when we looked at Daniel chapter 11, it says there shall yet three stand up in Persia. We're in the time of Cyrus. So that means we're looking at it in the time of Bush. And then we would mark Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, and then Trump would be the fourth. Now, in this whole line of the Persian kings, he would be the fifth. So if we're going to make Reagan number one, the first Persian king, that would disagree with what we understand about the kings of Persia. If we're going to line up Reagan as the first Persian king, he would then have to line up with Cyrus. And Bush the first would have to line up with Cambyses and Clinton with false Smyrnas and Bush the second with Darius the first. And Obama would then line up with Xerxes. Right? Is that what we would have to do? That would seem to be correct. Right. So, so that means we, we can't do that. Now, Stephen mentioned it, that Jeff, in some study, lined up Manasseh with Reagan. Um, but again, that would be inconsistent. So we're not sure. I don't know about that study. I, I don't remember seeing it. But it has to do because Manasseh means um, to forget. And, and that's Reagan forgetting uh, the characteristic of, of Rome, right? Forgetting about Rome and making this league with Rome. Um, but Manasseh, of course, is these are the last seven kings of Judah. So Manasseh all the way to Zedekiah. And that's on the bottom there. And then we have um, also the emperors of Rome. So Odilio did a study where he's going to line up, and I don't have his study here. I have because he's going to have the first one being uh, Julius Caesar, where really the first emperor and the one who would have to be there at the time of the end, that is when John the Baptist and Christ are born, would be Augustus. So, so Augustus would, Augustus would have to be in this list, these, the first of these emperors. Now, uh, you can see that, that we have 10 there. Now, part of this has to do with, um, once we start looking at Revelation chapter 12, which is, I think, where we should go next. But, but any comments about these, what we've talked about with these kings? 
I mean, do people sort of see the problem that, that we're facing in, in the various different interpretations of these kings of Persia, lining them up with the presidents and lining them up with the emperors? So this chart we're going to look at too. <clears throat> okay, so let's let's go to Revelation chapter 12. So this goes back to the study that we did. Um, uh, I guess it'd be like quite a while ago. Um, trying to remember when it was, but we did the presidency of the United States. So that would be like a year and a half ago. It's almost almost two years ago um, that we did the study on the presidents of the United States. So it was in 2022. It was in response to Collins' study. And do people remember what we learned about the pioneers' understanding of Revelation chapter 12, the beast of Revelation 12? 12. Could you repeat that again, please? What did we learn about the pioneers' understanding of Revelation 12? How did they understand this beast in Revelation 12? What did they understand it uh, to represent? I believe the historical application has been that this was pagan Rome, or excuse me, papal Rome. No, pagan Rome. So, so this is the dragon power, and the dragon power primarily uh, is a rep represent representation of Satan, right, the dragon, okay. but secondarily it represents pagan Rome. So that's what Ellen White says. So it's primarily Satan, uh, but it, it's secondarily uh, pagan Rome, because pagan Rome is going to be the power there at the birth of Christ. So this is... When we look at Revelation 12, uh, we see this woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Uh, this is representing God's people, Israel, right, the church. And, and she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. So this great red dragon is, we can say it's pagan Rome, but it, it is primarily a symbol of, of Satan. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered or to devour her child as soon as it was born. So this is with the birth of Christ that's being referenced. The woman is not Mary, but right, is Israel who's described as a, as a woman, as a virgin, and uh, many different passages. One that we looked at uh, yesterday, which was Isaiah 62, where it talks about um, this woman that's called uh, forsaken and desolate. All right, so if we go Isaiah 62, and Heidi and I read those two chapters, 61 and 62, yesterday from Isaiah. Uh, looked over them, but... Um, it says, uh, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. This is verse four. Neither shalt thou land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephziba and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. So this is referring to God's people to Jerusalem, to the land. Uh, all these things are included in this idea of this woman. So in Revelation chapter 12, uh, we have always un understood that this woman represents uh, God's people. And these are God's people in the time of pagan Rome. 
right? So the dragon seeks to destroy Christ, um, but he's preserved, right? Her child's cut up unto God into his throne. So that's Christ's ascension. And then the woman flees into the wilderness, right? So that's going to be the 1260 years of papal oppression, right? So we can see here the woman is God's people. Originally, it's Israel, but it becomes the Christian church. And then it's going to be the church that's being persecuted during 1260 years. Now, we're not going to go through the whole part there, but we know that in, in verse 9, it says, uh, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So you can see that this red dragon is, is a reference to Satan. Now, some people say, well, it's the great dragon, um, but it, it's called the great red dragon in verse 3. So there are some distinctions between them. Um, in verse 3, however, um, we have these characteristics of this dragon. It has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, how did the pioneers understand the seven heads and the ten horns? I hope the ten, the ten, the ten horns represented the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome. Okay, so let's just deal with the heads first. So the heads, what did they represent according to the pioneers? Seven forms of government. Yeah, so seven forms of government, right? Now, they had varying different lists on how they would understand uh, the seven heads or the seven forms of government. Um, so um, now they also sometimes were understood as the seven hills of Rome as well. So, um, so the, the hills were represented uh, and, and that you can see specifically in Revelation uh, chapter 17, right? So in Revelation 12, there are definitely um, these forms of, of Roman government. So uh, they can be kings, consuls, dic dictators, decemvirat, uh, mili military tribunes with consular power, and the triumvirate. So, um, so you have these seven different forms. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so, so, yeah, there's one, oh, then, and, and so there is, um, so the first five are going to be those. Um, so that's, that's different six. So it's going to be one of those, and then you're going to have, uh, you're going to have the, uh, emperors. That's going to be the sixth form of Roman government. That's not listed here. And then the seventh is going to be the papal form of government. So when it talks about five are fallen, there's going to be five forms of Roman government that are fallen. And, and I usually see in there like the re Republican is, it, Republicanism is one of the, the heads. So there's different ways in which people understand these heads. Um, but the five are fallen are, are the five before the emperors, because in the time in which John is, we have uh, imperial Rome with emperors. And then uh, so that's going to be the sixth. And then the seventh is going to be the papal form of Roman government. Any questions on that? So that's how the pioneers understood it. Any any questions about that? I can show you a quote from the pioneers if you want. Yes, please show that quote. Okay.
So, um, okay. I'm just going to George Butler. I'm just going to go with some earlier ones. Okay, here's what they say about the seven heads and ten horns. Um, so this is Revelation 12. The church is next represented. This is Josiah Litch. Uh, his book, The Probability of the Second Coming of Christ, about 1843. And it's in chapter 7, uh, page uh, 172. The church is next represented as bringing forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Um he has some quotes there, different verses. A great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. The stars are ministers of Christ. His tail, the latter part of his reign, casting the stars to the earth denotes his persecutions of Christians. He is called the dragon because of his dreadful character, which could not be represented by anything on earth. Therefore, he is represented by the monsters of hell. He is said to be red to denote the bloody and persecuting saints. His seven heads denote the seven forms of government under which Rome existed. Right. Um, so there's that one. And I probably could have shown you this. Another one by Josiah Litch. Um, but I'm going to show you one by uh, Loughborough. So let's go here. So this was well understood. Yeah, I know. I'm still showing the Bible. I realize that. I got to show you this. Okay. <clears throat> so this is Loughborough. This is the two horned beast of Revelation 13, a symbol of the United States. And in that's the title of the book. Um, and this is uh, the papal beast. Uh, that, that, that that's the section here so this is a section under the papal beast um but so this is chapter 13 he's looking at in revelation 13 the work of the papal beast is twice described his career ends in the first description with the statement i saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed these seven heads represent seven forms of government to which the people of this kingdom had been subject the seventh head or form was papal Right. So so you can see it's the same same type of view that you see uh, with Josiah Litch. Uh, this is William Miller. Uh, Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns, ten crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. By the sea, I understood the Roman government or fourth kingdom in Daniel's vision, and it denotes wicked nations. For the wicked are like a troubled sea. By the beast, we must, must understand the papal power, or little horn. Therefore, the paraphrase, therefore, to paraphrase this, it would read thus. And I, John, had a view of the Roman government. I saw a papacy rise up of it, having seven forms of government and ten kingdoms and ten kings thereon. And in their forms of government, they ascribe glory to the creator. So, here he's going to have seven forms of government once again. So this was just the way that this was understood by Miller, by the pioneers. There's, so there's lots of different quotes. I actually have 70, 77 uh, hits when I typed this in. Um, and... So there's seven kings, five are fallen. So he has a list here. Uh, the five of them, Republican, Consular, Decimiver, Dictatorial, Triumvirate. These forms had all passed when John saw his vision. And one is, that is the Imperial, then in power, and the other, Kingly, is not yet come. The kings did not exercise their power over the Empire of Rome, until after about 508 years after Christ, then the kingly must be supreme head for a short space, all of which did take place between AD 508 and 538. So, so you can see that there's varying different views on how to define this, but there's uh, 
unanimous disagree, unanimous agreement regarding the fact that the seven heads in some way represent forms of Roman government. So this is what was understood by the pioneers. Now, we have not taken that position. It's not a very common position in Adventism. Um, but, but it was the pioneer position. Now, uh, sometimes people try to have the, the heads to be uh, seven different emperors. So you'll see people using different lists. Um, uh, and then uh, you're going to have uh, sometimes the king. Uh, they're, they're going to be um, seen as the nations of Europe, different things like that. Um, and uh, in Rome, seven hills, uh, because when we look at, at Revelation 17, which we're going to look at in more detail, and we're going to look at that regarding the hills, uh, but often those are referred to as the mountains. And there's actually going to be uh, originally seven, and then there's going to be eight as Rome expands. So, so there's lots of different views on that. So we're going we're to look at that. We're just not going to look at it all in detail right now. Um, okay, I'm just looking at some other stuff here to decide where we're going to go. Okay, so let's go back to the scriptures here. So right now we're just taking a, a quick overview. We're not going into detail at this point. Um, now, as far as uh, the ten horns, uh, those are sometimes referred to as being of the different emperors. So, so there's two different primary views. One is that the ten horns always represent the same thing, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. Now, the thing about Revelation 12, verse 3, is that the crowns are upon the heads and not upon the horns, right? The seven, seven crowns upon his heads, and there's seven crowns. So when we look at Revelation 13, um, and it says, uh, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. So here you can see that the crowns now are upon the horns and there's 10 of them. So even though this beast is similar, we know it has some of the same characteristics as uh, the beast of Revelation 12. It's still not the same beast. And, and we know on the charts, it's labeled as papal Rome. So the first beast, this is technically the first beast in this section here. But, but the one in chapter 12, that first beast, it is pagan Rome. This one in chapter 13 is papal Rome. Now, why would the crowns be upon the horns and not upon the heads in chapter 13? So why did, are the crowns upon the ten horns, which we would look at as these ten divisions of Rome? and not upon the heads as they were in Revelation 12. Hi, Stephen. Uh, hi, Theodore. So this is uh, taking us towards, well, 60 time period. Yeah, so it's going to bring us to the 1260. Now, one of the questions I always had years ago when I would study this is I know that three of of the kings are going to be plucked up, right? Three of the horns are plucked up. Mm -hmm. And and so, but yet there's still 10. And um, how, how do we understand that? Why, why, if there's three are plucked up, why is there still 10 during the time of the papacy? Because the papacy has to pluck up those three in order to become the papacy. I have an understanding now, but I didn't have an answer back, you know, 35 years ago. 
Do we see it as typifying the ten in Revelation seventeen? Right. So so it's going to be tip, typified. So ten is just this characteristic of the world. So I mean, there is this ten divisions, but we know three are plucked up. But I, I think also we could look at in in Judges uh, when you have um, I can't think of his name. Um, uh, there's the seventy sons of uh, Gideon. Of Gideon or Jer- Jeroboam, right? And and the one son, which I can't think of his name, Jotham. What's what's that? Jotham. Yeah, Jotham. Yes. Okay, so I mean, it says that they slayed seventy sons, but actually they only killed sixty nine, right? Mm-hmm. So so just prophetically, that symbol still stays there. And, and the same here, you you have this symbol of ten. So even though three are going to be plucked up by the roots, three three of the horns, it still is ten. They're just incorporated into the papacy. Now, it's interesting, though, we have the ten and the three, and that, that makes seven and three to make ten, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So... So that symbol also comes to bear in other places. So, you know, so you got the seven, you got the three, you got the 10. Okay. So we can see that this is in a different time. So the one thing that we can say is that in Revelation chapter 12, John is seeing the time of Christ, when Christ is born, and he's going to be brought all the way uh, to the point at which the church flees into the wilderness, right, for 1260 years. And then in Revelation 13, he's going to see this papal beast that arises at the beginning of this 1260 years, and he's going to come to the end of that 1260 years, right? Because we're going to see that another beast arises. Yes. Okay. I would say, John, is in a sense there, when you look at the sound of the sea. Yeah. He's sort of between the sea and the earth. Okay. So in a sense, I I see that as being in 1798. And he's there in the first one. Yeah. So so John is taken to these different places in vision, right? I mean, he is in the first century. He's in 96 AD, they generally say. So uh, so at the end of the first century. But he's going to be brought to these different places in time. Daniel has the same thing happen to him as well, where he's you know brought to 457 BC, um, or at least brought to Persia even though he's in the time of Babylon. <clears throat> so, so yeah, so he's going to be here in 1798. He's going to be at the end of that 1260 in Revelation 13, where Revelation 12 brings him from the time of Christ to the beginning of the 1260 for the papacy. Right? That's that's how we would understand it. Because he's dealing with, with pagan Rome. And now he's dealing with papal Rome here. Um, But he's going to have this second beast arise. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. So he's on the sand of the sea, right? And now he's going to see a beast coming out of the earth. So he's between these two, uh, between those two periods of time, the, the 1260, because that beast is going to come up out of the out of the sea, right? It rises up in verse one out of the sea. So he's on the sand of the sea, and then he would have to turn to see the second beast coming up out of the earth. Now we know the earth helped the woman, right? So even though we have the sand, the, the that beast comes up out of the sea, we know that the earth helps the woman. So the 
the woman is going to flee into this wilderness. And and the, this beast, the United States, rises up out of the earth where Christians fled when they were being persecuted uh, by the papacy. They fled to the United States. And he has these characteristics. He has two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon. So these two horns um, bring us to Medo-Persia, to the ram that has two horns. But this power here that has two horns that, that parallels Persia is going to speak as a dragon. And he's going to exercise all the power of the first beast before him, that is the papal beast, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Right? So we're very familiar with this in verse 16. He causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And um, in verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 300, 603 score and six. Now, um, we spent time looking at this number 666 in the context of Miller's understanding is that he looked at this as a period of time, 666 years from 158 BC to five, um, 508, right? So he's going to count this 666 years. It would be an inclusive count once you uh, take into account there's no zero year, but he didn't do that because he didn't realize there was no zero year. Um, and he's going to take it the that period uh, that pagan Rome has from when it makes the league with the Jews uh, to uh, it being uh, the daily being uh, taken away. And then 30 years later, the papacy will be set up. That is the abomination of desolation set up. And then you have 1260 years. So that's how Miller would understand this. But we looked at these periods of 666 years because there's three of them. And there's one that connects Leviticus 26, the siege which in which Jehoiachin is taken captive to the siege of Jerusalem in 66 AD or 70 AD, I guess you would say that when it, the second siege, but that period of time, it's going to tie those two periods of time. One is Leviticus 26, one is Deuteronomy 28, and it ties them together by a period of 666 years. And um, so that means what pagan Rome inherits is they inherit something from Babylon, which is this mystery aspect of Babylon. But then we also see that there's 666 years that Miller believed and also 666 years uh, dealing with uh, Ju Judah's um, liberation going to 538. So from 129 uh, BC to, um, that's one, 159 BC to uh, 538 AD. So that's 666 years. And so these are all part of this structure. And there's more to those structures. Um, so we can see that this characteristic that the United States has um, is connected all the way back to Babylon, but it's also a characteristic of, of Rome, both pagan and papal Rome. And, and Miller wouldn't have understood the papal Rome part in how the how we do as far as that this has to do with the mark of the beast dealing with the Sunday Sabbath issue, right? Okay. Any thoughts on those observations? So somebody asked, I haven't got yet, yet got it clearly why the crowns are upon the horns, not on the heads in revelation 13. Okay. Um, so the crowns in Revelation 13 are upon the heads or upon the horns in chapter 12. They're on the heads. So it has to do with where the power lies. So with the papacy, does the papacy itself have the military power? Does it 
is it dependent upon the power of the kings, the, di the divisions of Rome, the different nations? Yes, they would be their rod, if you could say. Okay. Now, when it comes to the forms of Roman government, um, under pagan Rome, you can see that, that the crowns would be upon the heads, the different forms of Roman government that are going to be ruling during the period of Rome, both pagan and papal Rome, right? Because papal Rome is going to be one of the heads. Now, would we then have the horns and the heads represent the same things in each of these periods of time? So the way that we would look at the heads is these heads would be Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, the United States, and then the UN, right? That's how we see the seven heads. And we see the ten horns in this vision. The ten horns would be what in Revelation 13? Because we just, we just talked about it. What are the ten horns? Yeah, the ten divisions of the yeah, Roman the ten, Empire. Right, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. But that wouldn't be the case in Revelation 17, right? In Revelation 17, the ten horns can't possibly be the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, right, of, of the papacy. So, so we see that even though we have the same symbol, the symbols have to be interpreted differently in each of these periods of time. Do, do we see that? Because they're different. These ten horns that have crowns are definitely different than Revelation 17, where there's no crowns at all. So in Revelation 17, when we look at uh, this beast, the scarlet colored beast, it has seven heads and ten horns. Right. And it has a woman riding it. So so there's definitely a distinction here because the woman is the papacy. It's mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Right. And this, it's a woman. It's a church riding this beast, fornicating with it is the idea here. And um, so this woman that's. Uh, riding this beast being the papacy, we can see that that's different than what happens in Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, the beast is the papal beast. But you can't say here that the beast is the papal beast. But it still has seven heads and ten horns. But no crowns at all. That is, it says um, in verse uh, 10, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and one is not yet come. Right? So, so we know that there's seven kings, and then it's going to talk about the horns. Um, and in verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So we're going to see that that, now, we always just say, well, the seven kings are seven kingdoms, right? Which they are. At least that's how we've understood it. But we're making different applications of Revelation 17. So the seven, uh, the, the, the ten horns that are, are ten kings, but they have no kingdom. That is, they have no crown. So there's no crown on the heads, no crowns on the heads, no crowns on the horns. Now, uh, I mean, the woman herself, it doesn't mention anything uh, about a crown specifically, but she is arrayed in purple, scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And she has this cup in her hand. And, you know, it's possible she could have a crown on her head, but it doesn't say that. But she definitely is, is decked out. Okay. So do the heads in Revelation 12 have to be the same heads in Revelation 13 and the same heads in Revelation 17? 
Because if the if the horns are not the same, would the heads also not be the same? Here we're just posing questions, things that we, uh, because the pioneers are just going to make the heads the same and, and uh, the horns the same. But we can see that the horns can't be the same. Because they're always just going to have the horns as the 10 divisions of Rome. So do we see that we have to we have to examine this point and try to, to try to understand it? So again, the question: Do the heads have to be the same? Represent the same thing in each of the beasts? Do the heads have to be always seven forms of Roman government? Well, the seven heads in Revelation 13 have been connected to Daniel 7, where you have the lion and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, so, um, yeah, and Daniel 7, and the thing when we do that in Daniel 7, we can see that the, the beast of Revelation 13 has these characteristics of the beast of Daniel 7, right? The feet of a bear, you know, it's like unto a leopard, his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. So you so those first three uh, beasts in Revelation or Daniel chapter seven, pardon me, are characterized here in how this beast looks. And then it says the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And and so you could say the dragon is that fourth beast, the diverse beast. Correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we can see. Even if the pioneers are correct about Revelation chapter 12, that there's seven forms of Roman government, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to say that here uh, because of the characteristic of this beast. It's, it's a different beast, and it has, um, you know, and the thing about Rome is that this is, represents its syncretism. Right. It's its ability to synthesize and incorporate the different characteristics of these nations before them that had been su su successive. And and Rome has all of those characteristics. It has the characteristics of Greece. It has the characteristics of Medo-Persia. It has the characteristics of the lion and the dragon power. We know that the dragon primarily is a symbol of Satan, but secondarily represents pagan Rome. So if pagan Rome gave the power seat and great authority to the papacy, it now has all of these characteristics of the kingdoms that went before it, right? So it's it's papal Rome, and Rome, its characteristic is the syncretism. So that means the heads representing Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome pagan, Rome papal, and then what we see in Revelation 17, these other aspects, you're going to see the United States being one of those heads, and also the UN being one of those heads, or at least that's how we've done it. And so we're, we're examining these things again to see if they make sense. But we're just putting before you in a review of what we sort of understand about these things, the things that we notice. And we might come to some different conclusions as we look at it. But we definitely we can say if the heads in Revelation 12 are the seven forms of Roman government, they wouldn't be the seven forms of Roman government in Revelation 13. Or they don't have to be. Can, can we agree with that? I can agree. Yeah. And and, and the thing that we would we would say about it is that. Um, uh, 
that that if that's the case, if we can we can look at at different points in history, that the heads represent something different, um, that the horns represent something different, that that we have to sort of revamp a little bit our our understanding of of how we looked at it, how we have looked at this. Because what most people will do is they'll say, either we just accept the pioneer views, the seven heads of the seven forms of Roman government, and we apply that to Revelation 12, 13, and 17, or we say the seven heads are the seven progression of these kingdoms from Babylon all the way up to the kingdom at the end of the world. But we keep it consistent. But I have not seen... Uh, very many people who would say, well, the pioneers were right about Revelation 12, but wrong about Revelation 13. Okay. Do we have anything else in scripture that can connect the, these here seven forms of Roman government? For Revelation 12? Yes. Mm. What what kind of thing would you want to use to to show that? I kind of know what you're asking. Like, how do they do that? How do the pioneers just say this is seven forms of Roman government? Yes, I just don't see it elsewhere. You know, this is a, the theme of Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome is something which is repeated and often. Okay. And, and so, these here visions and prophecies, but just to sort of say these here seven heads are now the seven forms of Roman government. This is not something which is not really a theme that has been, I don't see how it has been dwelled upon in scripture. Okay. Um, well, we would agree that this is pagan Rome. Right, Revelation twelve mm -hmm. is there, and mm -hmm. we can say that in here there isn't characteristics of papal Rome, right? And there isn't the that we're not looking at the beasts here, right? So we don't see this great red dragon doesn't it doesn't look anything like the beast in Revelation thirteen. So we know it is a different beast, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so we know it's a different beast. Um, now we can say Rome always incorporates uh, these other powers, but the question is, what is actually being characterized here? What is what is it that's that's being represented in Revelation twelve? Well, it's going to be an attack against Christ, right at his birth. That's going to be done by pagan Rome. And pagan Rome is uh, definitely connected to the dragon here in this context. So what would be the reason that we would say that these have to be uh, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome? Is it just because we have that in Revelation 13? Or because I'm just sort of saying the argument is, why would it have to be Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, and the United States and the UN if we're dealing with Pagan, Rome? And, and then the other question is the oh, 10. Well, in a sense, Rome does, I know that it's focusing on Pagan, Rome here, but in a sense, Rome does continue. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Rome is really goes all the way to the end, but this is pagan Rome, not papal Rome. Now, then also the ten horns. Now, uh, the ten horns. Uh, one of the things that we we were looking at in that chart that I had is if we go from Augustus to Titus to that period of time from what we call the time of the end all the way to the destruction of Jerusalem, and then the general who destroys Jerusalem uh, becoming emperor, Titus X. Um, and in his reign, 
uh, the fall of Pompeii and Herculeum uh, with the with the explosion of Mount Vesuvius, the eruption at Mount Vesuvius. Um, often people have made attempts to look at those 10 horns as the 10 Roman emperors. There's different ways in which people have done it. But the pioneers took the 10 horns to be uh, the 10 divisions of Rome. So Rome is going to divide into 10 horns. Right? Um, and five, four and seventy six onwards, that type of time period. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to divide. Well, during that whole period in which it's divided by um, the Germanic tribes coming in and basically dividing up Rome, Western Rome, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's the way the pioneers would look at it. They would look at the seven forms of Roman government and then the ten horns. But some people have also tried to apply apply the horns to the emperors. They've also tried to apply the heads to the emperors, right? So, um, so yeah, so we've just generally said, well, the seven heads, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, and then the U.S. And, and so that that seven heads just represents that period of time in which you go from Babylon to the end of the world. Now, uh, the pioneers' understanding is that this was going to the period, because it's it's in the period in which um, John is prophesying, and that he's going to see these these heads. Now, of course, one of the heads, from their perspective, the papal, has not yet come, right? So they're going to say five of fallen, one is, one has not yet come. They're going to use Revelation seventeen for that. Um, so this is so this is a good question that Stevens. Posing, how do we come up with an interpretation of the seven heads that there are seven forms of Roman government? Is there some precedent there? Now they have crowns upon their heads, right? So this is definitely referring to some kind of kingdom. So if it's seven forms of Roman government, it's it's limiting this dragon to pagan Rome. If it's Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, it's it's saying that this great red dragon is continuing to the end of the world, right? But we know that pagan Rome doesn't continue to the end of the world. Papal Rome does. So what we would do normally is we'd look at at 13, we can say, well, that definitely fits all of these kingdoms. And then because that has seven heads, we go back to Revelation 12 and say, well, the heads must be the same. But if we saw it as divisions of Rome, Roman government, would that, would that be, would we, can we accept that, that that's a possibility? Not that it's necessarily the right interpretation, but it's a possible interpretation. Well, I think it's good to examine and to, yeah. uh, to look at what the pioneers said anyway, you know, to evaluate. Now, another way that people look at this is when it comes to this heads, because if you look at Revelation 17, and it talks about... Uh, um, I'm just going to get there, 17, and it talks about, um, here's a mind that has wisdom, uh, verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, there are the seven hills of Rome, right? Yes. So, so often, that's the way in which this is understood. There's the, the seven hills, and and so we say, well, that's that's the hills of Rome, and they're symbolizing uh, the different forms of Roman government. Right. So 
Now, now some people just put the eighth as, as being papal Rome, so it's a whole other other interpretation. Um, but if we if we look at these hills, um, there's uh, there's Romulus, Numa. Let me see. Let me see here. No, Aventine, Palatine, Capulatine, Caline, Carinal, Viminal, and Esquiline. Um, but they also had at an eighth hill later on when the walls of Rome uh, are extended. And some people have these representing seven kings. That's Romulus, Numa, Pompilius, Tullus, Hostilius, Ancus, Marcius, Lucas, Priscus, Tarquinius, Servius, Tullius, and Lucius, Tarquinius, Superbus, right? So these are going to be the the seven kings of Rome reigning in Rome before the Roman Republic. So they're going to, um, before it becomes a republic, those are the kings. Um, so, so there's these different views. Now, we're, we're going to look at these in more detail later on. But all I'm saying is that there's different ways in which people have tried to understand these things. Um, so later on, when they get the wall of Servius, um, they're going to end up with all of these uh, these hills within these walls. But uh, and I'm I'm not an expert on this. I don't remember all the names of of everything. I'm just looking at a page here that's talking about it. Um, so so when we have the crowns upon the heads in chapter twelve, and then the crowns upon the horns. Um, there's different, and that question was asked, why? Um, so we know that with, with, as we mentioned, with Papal Rome, you have these independent sovereign nations. Uh, so it's, it's divided. But that's not the case with Rome. But Rome does progress. So that's why they say the crowns are upon the heads instead of on the horns. The horns are going to represent the divisions of Rome. And then, of course, in Revelation 17, there's no horns at all. So, or no crowns at all, pardon me, either on the horns or the heads. So, and then we have that riddle, which we're going to have to look at. And the question is, do we apply that riddle to Revelation 12 and 13? Because if the heads and the horns are different in each of these uh, beasts, does the riddle apply to each of the beasts? Or do we just apply it to the last beast? And then trying to figure out what the heads are in the last beast, what's being represented. Uh, that would be an important point. The other thing about this one is that we have the woman, the papacy, riding this beast. So we, we know that this is different than chapter 13, where you have this beast that is the papal beast, and then the United States, the two-horned beast. In Revelation 17, you see a beast that has a woman on it. So obviously that beast can't be the same beast. The beast that she's riding can't be the papacy, correct? If the woman is the papacy and she's riding the beast, what is the beast in Revelation 17? Well, would that be a different beast then from the beast that does in 17 verse 8? Okay, so you're saying um, that you have a woman riding a beast that has seven heads and ten, ten horns, Right. Or, or you're saying that this beast that the woman's riding is a different beast than the beast in verse 8. Because it says the beast that carried her had seven heads and ten horns. And then you're saying in, ver in verse 8, are you saying that's a different beast? Is that what you're asking? Well, to me, it, it looks like it's the deadly wound. So that the base is the papacy there that was in the sense that she was riding mm -hmm. um, ten horns. Right. Yeah. So twelve sixty, yeah. and then so this, yeah, the exactly. one is not, 
and then she'll ascend. So she's gonna, in a sense, ride the beast right. again. So this has always been one of the problems with the interpretation that we've generally used of Revelation 17, is we would say, it's just one beast in Revelation 17. The papacy is riding that beast, but the papacy is also one of the heads, which seems inconsistent. So a solution to that is to say that in verse 8, it's actually referring to some other beast, a beast that's represented earlier. Does that make sense? Is this beast... Um, connection with church and state? Well, I don't know. All, all we're doing right now is we're not, we're not necessarily giving the answers. We're, we're looking at the problems that exist, right? So, so we would have to figure that out. What is this beast that she's riding? And then is it the same beast that's being described in verse 8? So there are different in, in ways in which people look at this. But generally, we have always just looked at it. It's just the same beast. The woman is riding this beast on which she is one of the heads. But maybe there's some other solution to that. And one is to see two different beasts in Revelation 17. That it's going to refer back to an earlier beast that had seven heads and ten horns. Now, the thing about this one, though, is that this beast has seven heads and ten horns, but there's no crowns. So, so that becomes another problem if we're, we're going to say, well, this beast is like some other beast, but it's different because this has to be the beast at the end of the world. And are the, and when we say that the ten kings are, are the kingdoms of this world, the United Nations, that's, that's the, the, the horns, right? But the heads we have is Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. Now, we also have applications where people will take that these heads represent either popes, or in Colin's case, he's making an application in which he's saying that these are presidents of the United States. So in this whole thing, what has happened since December 25th, 2021, is it's caused us to look at how we've understood these things in the past and, and to see if there's something that we have missed. So the, one of the things that I believe is that if we have new light, it should make old light shine brighter. That is, new light that rejects old light isn't new light at all. And we know that there's light that's come throughout the history of, from the Millerite movement to the Seventh-day Adventist church to this movement, there's understandings that we have. And we, we're not going to be like people who just say, well, the pioneers understood it a certain way, so we're going to reject any interpretation that's different. Because we know there is new light that will make that old light shine brighter. Some people don't want to have new light. They just want what was. We also have to recognize that there may be stuff that we understand that is inconsistent with past light. That is, there might be things that we believe that is false light, but it wasn't new light. It was just things that we accepted as Seventh-day Adventists that came in um, like people could say, well, you know, the pioneer view of the daily, uh, that's wrong because we you know, Adventist church believes something different. But we're not just going back to the pioneer view of the daily. We're actually understanding it in ways that the pioneers never understood it. And so we could do the same thing with Re Revelation 12, 13, and 17. That is, we may come to see some things about these chapters that we never recognized before. So we have to be willing to set aside some of our ideas, but anything that we come to conclusions on is going to have to magnify what was understood in the past. It's going to make it clearer and understandable. 
Because I believe that there's actually a mixture of what the pioneers understood um, with what we understand, that, they, that they're not inconsistent. Now, sometimes, like if you take Colin's understanding, he's making an application, right? And, and the question is, can he make that application in the way that he's doing it? Because this all relates to those first seven kings of Persia, the last seven kings of Judah. We have to say, how can we take these, these heads and apply them to presidents of the United States? Can we do that? And, and before we looked at even applications in applying them in some ways to the papacy. Now, I've looked at all the different interpretations about, you know, going back to the Lateran Treaty and counting the number of popes, and, and it's just not going to work, right? Might have made sense in the 1990s when we had Pope John Paul II. You could line them up in some way. But now we've, we've gone too far beyond that with, you know, we're now Pope Francis, and we've gone two more popes, and so so you can see the problem that we have there. That there's something that we don't understand. Now, I believe that Colin directed us by God's direction. God used Colin to direct us to this study for a reason. And 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 the best thing would have been if this movement as a whole spent time studying this together. That didn't happen. We're studying it sort of, we got our study going on and Colin has his study and other people might be doing their studies. Um, but we're not going to leave any stone unturned in this regard. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep in mind all the things we've studied so far. The story of Esther, um, what we studied in regard to uh, um, you know, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel's last vision. And, and we're going to come back to that because we're going to say that this is going to be connected. And then we're going to have, and we've also looked at these, the seven kings of Persia, of course, and the last seven kings of Judah. So now where are we going to go from here? How are we going to approach this? Because we already have done a study on this in a sense. We, we went through Dan, uh, Revelation 12, 13, and 17 when we were studying the presidents of the United States. Is it just that we have to go a little bit deeper? What is it we have to do? Well, it's always good to look for you. Sort of uh, dig deeper if we can. Okay, so how are we going to get deeper? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> See if some. Uh... Yeah, it's just good to look at it again just to see if there's any means of going deeper arises. Right, so, so we're going to have to look at Miller's rules and apply them. We're going to have to look at what, again, what the pioneers believed and why. So why did they come to those conclusions? And, and we're going to look at a lot of things that the pioneers never considered, right? So we're going to look at all of these different views. Now, when we deal with Revelation 12, 13, and 17, so one of the things that the pioneers did and, and we would include Joseph Bates in this, is that they had this understanding about, uh, and, and Joseph Bates, this is primarily his understanding in 1851. So in the Advent Review, um, August 5th, 1851, he says, the beast that was denotes the Roman Republic that was 1900 years ago and is not. That is, it was not when John was having his vision in AD 96, because Imperial Rome was then the form of government and continued to be until AD 538. When the seventh form of government came, that is Papal Rome, even he is the eighth. 
The eighth undoubtedly is, as we have shown, the two horn beast with its image, a symbol of the people of Republican America, as they will be and is of the seven. The eighth will cause all under his influence to worship the one that is called the seventh. So the way that Joseph Bates understood this is that in Revelation uh, 13, when we see the United States come into power, it's actually the eighth, right? So it's going to be the eighth form or the eighth kingdom, and it's going to take on the characteristics of republic, right? So, so it's quite a di bit different view than we have today. So we're going to have to, to see if there's any light in what Joseph Bates was teaching. And Theodore, can you get the yeah. references out? Well, that's I, the references out? Yeah, the reference of the pioneers. I gave you the I gave you the reference. The Adventist Review, August fifth, eighteen fifty one. I mean, it's page four if you want to be more specific. I think uh, just without the there of bits, he's he seems to be skipping when the Uriaser became king. And 476, he was king of Italy. So he skips him out. And then there was another, like Theodosius, was it? No, it's um, mm -hmm. Theodor Theodoric became the king then. And then there's, so he, he seems to sort of skip that aspect. Mm -hmm. If he's going to just take it to 538 and have the papacy. Yeah, well, what he's going to do is he's going to have, um, uh, yeah, the beast that was and is not is the Roman Republic. So he's going to go back to nineteen or to ninety six A.D. and he says that that's the time of Imperial Rome. Imperial Rome is the sixth form of government, and then the papacy is the seventh form of government. Right. So he's having the seven heads representing forms of government, and so then he just has the eighth is going to be the United States. Because it's it's Republican again. So Republican is the thing that's resurrected. I'm not saying that he's right. I'm just saying that this is how he saw it. That is, he saw the eighth as being the United States. That is the two-horned beast. So anyway, we're gonna we're gonna go over these things, but I think this is where we need to spend our time uh, for the next while. We need to we need to bring together these chapters and then see how they relate to what we see in the book of Daniel. That they that that we can unify this with what we understand in the book of Daniel. So any quick any final thoughts before we close with prayer? <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We just ask for your spirit to be with us throughout this day and that uh, we can study these things and come to an understanding. We know, Lord, that um, there's so little that we know, um, but we trust that you can guide and direct us, help us individually to seek you diligently in our study and in prayer. And we pray for this movement at this time that uh, you can uh, bring us together. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.